Gleam 1.14 is here. Named the Happy Holidays release, it is full of language server additions and quality of life improvements. Let's take a look at the changes. First off, let's look at the new language features in this version. The record update syntax has been expanded to work with constants as well. So you can define some value, which is a record, and then you can define another constant with the same values as that first one, but with something updated. This can be useful for, for example, providing different versions of a default configuration. And if we run this, you can see that it will print out as expected, the initial value, then the same value with something updated, and then another update again. On the JavaScript target, Gleam supports emitting TypeScript declarations, which create a typed interface for your compiled Gleam code. The problem is that if you ever use an external type, which is basically a type with no constructors, it is effectively opaque to Gleam and only can be used to represent some data that is handled in FFI code. Since we don't know what this type is, we have to compile it to a TypeScript any type, indicating that we don't know what the type is. The problem is this kind of defeats the whole point of having types. If you say a value can be anything, then there's no point in having a type in the first place. In 1.14, the external attribute can now be used on types with no constructors to tell the compiler what to generate for the type annotations when either generating Erlang type annotations or TypeScript definitions. And you can see here in the TypeScript, it will just re-export the dict type. And on Erlang as well, it defines this type as what we've told it to. Next, let's look at the performance and quality of life improvements made in this version. In 1.13, when you compared two identical record constructors together, the compiler would emit a warning telling you that it would always result in true. This makes sense when you think about it because you're comparing an identical thing to itself, but actually you're comparing two different functions which construct a record. And if we actually run this code, you will see that it prints out false, contrary to what the warning claims. Now when comparing two construct functions, the compiler will no longer issue a warning. In Gleam 1.13, any fields of custom types that had an error in them would just be ignored, leading to cascading errors that really just stem from a single error. If I change this non-existent type to one that exists, all the other diagnostics go away. So really, these are false positives. Whereas in 1.14, this field is the only error and using it does not result in another cascading error. In Gleam, if you have a documentation comment, which is followed by a regular comment, that doc comment doesn't actually get attached to this function. If I hover over this, it doesn't show the documentation. This was a decision made a while ago to prevent documentation comments jumping around if you temporarily comment out a function implementation. If you fail to notice this, then you might end up publishing some library that doesn't have the documentation that you want it to have. In 1.14, a new warning has been added to tell you when a documentation comment is detached and explain to you how to fix that. When creating a Gleam library, it's possible to create a file and then forget to delete it and then end up accidentally publishing a library with an empty module in it. In 1.14, there's a new warning that tells you that a particular module doesn't have any public definitions. And if you try to publish a package with an empty module, it will give you an error and tell you that you need to delete that file. In Gleam, pattern matching is one of the fastest ways to do a lot of things, including string parsing. Now, something you might often want to do is match on a specific set of characters at the beginning of the string and then assign that particular prefix to a variable and do something with it. The problem was that in 1.13, this code would end up generating Erlang that was slower than doing it without this aliasing. Without the aliasing, this would essentially generate the fastest code possible, which is matching on each of these possible prefixes. And that can effectively be optimized to a jump tree when compiled to bytecode. When using aliasing, though, it had to compile to a guard instead, which ended up being about 10 times slower by some benchmarks. In 1.14, this case has been improved. It will now generate the same pattern matching code as it would without the binding, and it generates the binding inside the body of the case branch instead. Exhaustiveness checking, that is, checking if a particular case expression covers all possibilities, is very tricky, especially when it comes to bit arrays. Matching the string A is equivalent to matching the value 97, because 97 is the UTF-8 encoding of the character A. 
And similarly, if you match a single bit that is a 1 followed by any bit, that will always match before two bits that are both 1. In Glean 1.13, the compiler was unable to tell that these pairs of segments match the exact same thing. In 1.14, this has been improved, so these two patterns can be marked as unreachable by the compiler, and it also improves the performance of pattern matching on the JavaScript target. Similarly, if multiple branches matched on the same value but with a different representation, for example, all of these branches match on 100 but they have slightly different syntax to do so, the compiler would also not be able to tell that these all match the same thing. In 1.14, these are all marked as unreachable as they match on the exact same value as this first one. In Gleam, Boolean literals use capital letters. This can be a source of confusion to people coming from other languages where they're all lowercase. To avoid this, using lowercase booleans is an error and it tells you to use capital instead. The problem that with this in 1.13 is that this was a syntax error, meaning that if you accidentally had a lowercase boolean literal, no other LSP features would work and you wouldn't get any kind of autocomplete or anything like that. In 1.14 these have been changed to a type error, which means that having this error doesn't break the rest of your code and you still get autocomplete and other things. Gleam, unlike JavaScript, uses structural equality when using the double equals operator. This means that on the JavaScript target, since it's not the default behavior, we need to implement it ourselves. The problem is that this equality is pretty slow. For example, this code, where I'm checking if a particular user is a guest, in 1.13, is much better written as this case expression, where I pattern match on it instead, since this would use an instance of check on JavaScript, which is much faster than the whole comparison function. In 1.14, this case has been optimized so when you're checking a value against a singleton type as in one that doesn't have any fields it will use an instance of check which is much faster than the is equal function used for other comparisons. A fairly common mistake in Gleam is to try to combine alternative patterns with multiple subjects something like this. The first subject is matches either one or two, and then the second subject has to be true. Now this isn't how alternative patterns work. In Gleam, alternative patterns only work at the top level, so both branches must match on the second subject. But the problem was that in 1.13, the error would highlight the entire case branch, making it difficult to understand what the actual problem was. In 1.14, this error message has been improved, so it only shows the pattern that is causing the error, making it easier to understand. A fairly common confusion about Gleam is the behavior of the commands Gleam run, Gleam test, and Gleam dev. Here I have three files. I have v114.gleam, v114test.gleam, and v114dev.gleam. v114 is the name of the project defined in my gleam.toml, and in each of these I just have a main function that prints something to the console. Now you can see if I, for example, run Gleam test, it will print out no tests to run today. People often assume that Gleam test is doing some kind of magic test discovery, but really all it's doing is running the main function of the file named your project followed by underscore test. The same applies to dev for Gleam dev and just the same project name for Gleam run. In Gleam 1.13, if we, for example, see the help text for the test command, it will say run the project tests. Now this is a bit misleading because I, as I mentioned, it's not actually running the tests, it's just running the main function of a specifically named module. In 1.14, this help message has been improved so that it tells you that it runs the main function of the project name underscore test module. Finally, let's look at all of the changes and improvements that have been made to the language server in 1.14. So in Gleam 1.13, a code action was added where if you had a function call where the function contained some labels, you could trigger this code action to add all the labels that were missing. But the problem with this code action was that if your call already had one or more of the labels, but it was still missing some, this code action wasn't offered. In 1.14, the code action also supports the case where one or more labels have already been added and it'll simply fill in the missing ones. For quite a long time now, Gleam has had a code action to take some kind of definition and add type annotations to it, which is inferred by the compiler. But if you have lots of different definitions in a file that you want to annotate all of them, there was no real good way to do that. You would just have to go through and manually annotate each of them. In 1.14, there is a new code action that can be triggered when hovering over any definition, and it will automatically annotate every single public definition for you.
The language server autocomplete has been improved, so now whenever you are completing a variable or function, any values which match the expected type at that point will be listed first. So for example, if I expect an int here and I type this, the integer value is going to appear first. But if I expect a float, the float value will appear first. The same is true for functions which return the desired type. So here's a function that returns a float and here's a function that returns an int. This next one I have to quickly jump over to Z as it doesn't affect VS Code. Z, as well as many other editors, have a feature where you can jump to the next diagnostic in the file so you can fix it. In 1.13, certain diagnostics were effectively two different diagnostics, meaning you had to click through them twice in order to skip past them. In 1.14, this has been fixed, so related diagnostics are grouped together and treated as just a single one. The code action to generate a function from a call, if the function doesn't exist, already takes into account if you pass it a variable, it will use that variable as the name. If instead you were to use record access like this, in 1.13 it would just default to the name of the type that it was given. In 1.14 the generate function code action has been improved, so now if you use record access it will use those as the argument names as well. It has also been expanded to work in constants, so if you have a constant that references some non-existent function, you can generate it. Sometimes two or more branches of a case expression end up having the same implementation, and in that case you want to merge the branches together. In 1.14 there is a new code action to do that, you simply select the case branches you want to merge, and select merge, and it will merge them into a single alternative pattern. In Gleam 1.13, the add missing patterns code action to fill in a case expression would add patterns in alphabetical order. This is often not desired as you often want patterns grouped or ordered in a specific way. In 1.14, this has changed, so now when you add the missing patterns, they will be in the same order as they are defined in the custom type, which is often the order you want to match on them anyway. In Gleam 1.13, if we have some code like this and we want to trigger a code action to pattern match on this argument, it would create two very nondescript names, value 0 and value 1. In 1.14, this has been improved so that when you pattern match on a tuple, it will use the names of the types of the elements of the tuple. For quite a while now, Gleam has had a code action to take a qualified value and unqualify it. But in 1.13, this would not apply to constants as well. This constant is still qualified and there's no way to trigger this code action here. In 1.14, it's been expanded to work with constants as well. So you can both trigger it from constants and if you trigger it from elsewhere, constants will be unqualified and requalified again as well. And those are all the 1.14 changes. You can download the latest version from the link in the description and I'll also link to the release post where you can read the changes in text form and the change log which contains details of everything in the update including the full list of bug fixes. Happy holidays and enjoy this version of Gleam.